Next, we are going to talk about a few other things. One of them is views. So remember that uh, one thing we've learned the last time was that you can write queries and treat them as if they were um, that they were actual relations. So you, we said that you can actually take a query and the, basically treat the query, the results, as if it was actually a new uh, table or a new relation that is stored. For example, um, or let's say if you've got student ID to that grade from transcript T, where that great. For example, many of the queries that I write involve this condition where I need to check that t.grade is not null and t.grade is not equal to i. So now I actually have a new relation R that is just a student ID and grade from transcript for only those tuples that are not null or I. So I can actually return them if I want to, like this. Trying to figure out what I'm doing wrong. There we go. Okay. And the point is that if I were to actually change the name, for example, I change, I rename these columns, then I can just use them here. Okay. Now the point of doing this is actually to do some complex operation that you cannot do inside the uh, query, or if you were, that was going to be very complicated. So you pre-compute some things, and then you use that in the other one. For this simple query, this is probably not really very useful. And in fact, what will most likely going, what, what is most likely going to happen is, depending on the database you use, it may not understand that this exact query can be solved with a join. And for joins, there are some really efficient implementations that will probably be faster if you do the join than this. Okay? It really depends on how the relation is stored, but doing it like this may or may not actually save you some real uh, time. But what may also happen is that the database will say, okay, you write it like this, but I don't really care about what you want to do. This is actually the same as this query, where I basically um, can use transcript t, where t dot student id. It is, in fact, the same as this query. So what I will do is I will take this complex expression that you wrote. I'm going to rewrite it using a join. Then I'm going to optimize this one. Okay. 
So very often what happens is that when you write even more complex nested expressions, the database very aggressively will try to write it as a join and then optimize that join because there are lots and lots of different types of join which we will see after the exam and they are highly optimized. So it is much more likely that I can see more optimizations when I write it like this than something else. Okay? So even though you wrote that query like that, doesn't mean it's implemented like that. You will actually see you have very little influence on what the database wants to do with your queries. Okay? So, so these, are we okay so far? Well, what you can do is you can take that in a query and you can even give it a name. Okay? If it's something that you are going to use very frequently, this part, this query itself, I can give it a name. So instead of treating this as a single anonymous query that I executed only once, I'm going to actually give this whole thing a query, a, a, a view, a name, which I will then call it a view. So create view. Uh, valid grades or fin val let's say valid grades as this query. Remember that when I was doing uh, insert update, I saw that you can create a table using a query. This is the same thing. I'm creating a new view using a query. So it is not a real table. It is simply a view. And in fact, all that the database will do is store this in some other table as this SQL expression. Just a string, okay? Exactly as what this is, okay? So, for example, but the thing is that I can treat this like I treated R up here. So, for example, I can say select star from valid grace which has only a student ID and a grade and I can actually uh, change for example the names of attributes by calling them ID and G So now the attributes are called I, D, and G. So I can do the same thing that I was doing up here. But instead of this whole query, now I'm just going to use valid grades. Okay. Now what has really happened is that basically to execute this, the database goes and finds what is this valid grades thing? It's a view. What is a view? It's just a query. What is the query? Well, let me find the description of the query which is here. Put it in here instead of the valid grades. And what I will get is exactly this expression that I had before. This expression. And before I even execute this expression, I'm going to optimize it by trying to rewrite it without an inner query, but using just a join. So I'm going to rewrite this to get this thing, most likely, depending on your database engine. Okay. And then I'm going to optimize. So it's very important to really understand that views are just queries. There is no total store for them. I will say this, but you will all ask me how do you store the tuples in the views. Okay, views are just queries. All right. Um, so why would you then use views? What is the point of views then? So very often you basically have a database that has hundreds of tables, right? How many how many tables do you think are in SIS? There are probably crazy 
interesting number of tables that you cannot imagine. Because there are tables about the exceptions that students got, exceptions about the course, and which course requires which, but for this few calculus that this course and this course together are counting for that course, it's a crazy number of different things, right? So, and then there's tables that have to do with um, money, right? So there is all sorts of uh, uh, financial stuff regarding students and faculty. There's tables that have to do with the proposals that we write and our budget. It's crazy if you think about how much stuff is in there. So it's a huge system. So what you don't really want when you get a new programmer to actually have access to all of them, right? You don't want them to really know everything about the financial if they all have to work within the small piece. So furthermore, you don't necessarily want them to understand all the intricate details of some of the store because all they want is this one view that they are going to use to display the capital for you. So what the views will do is they can they can hide all of that complexity and create basically kind of windows to the tables for the function that you need. And you can write your application using that function. And sometimes, sometimes meaning all the time, you actually have to change databases. But that's okay because even though your tables change, as long as you can write a view that has the same attributes, I don't have to change my program. So I can write my program using the front end, the views, and then the tables kind of have to map to them. This is, this is an idealized world, right? It's not always possible, but it's a general idea of kind of separating yourself from the intricate details of tables. And let me tell you that as you exit from this class, you will be the most knowledgeable person in any organization you know, with the exception of very few cases. I've heard this from many people, right? You already know a lot more than most people, right? So those people who can say, well, here's the view, just play it down. And then you're going to write access control using the views, not the tables. The tables only you can access, or the admin. And then the views, you say, well, these two people can read the uh, views for, let's say, uh, transcript. And this person can read the views for financial. This person can read the stuff for, let's say, the home address of faculty, right? So all of that information you can then partition and decide what the access control is. So all that views are doing is allowing you to define kind of different windows into the same table, okay? But there is no um, performance update, performance uh, improvement by having a view. And in fact, it could be the reverse. <coughs> it could be that because you have a view that the database misses some optimization, okay? Which is a concern that you have to worry about. <coughs> so, if you wanted to really improve performance, right, you then have to actually store some information, cache it, and reuse it, okay? So that is a different problem. That you can do using two different things. So you can do uh, what is called a materialized view, meaning that take a view like this, like this, but materialize it, meaning that actually compute the tuples in it, store it in a table. So this is like create table from query, except once you say create table from query, you lost what the query was, right? So if you say create table from, uh, select star from transcript, table, copy okay once you create the copy you forgot that it actually was a copy of transcript whereas a materialized view is actually one that knows what is the query that generates that that means you can recopulate um, but materialized views are not actually a uh, standard they are implemented in few places Postgres is one of them and, um, and the point is that they will not be updated every time you update the table. You actually have to tell it to repopulate. 
And the repopulating may mean that you actually recompute the whole thing. So it is not necessarily a great thing. Okay? So, you know, we will say that materialized views exist, but we will not care about them in this class. Well, what we do care is a thing called an index. So index, in many ways, is like a view. It basically is a copy of everything in the table. So let's say, let's take this one. <coughs> so this is a query that I keep asking. Right? I often need to know which uh, tuples correspond to a grade for the users and disregard all the tuples that are not uh, that are not that are null or incomplete. So if I have a query like this, then the attribute that I care about is which attribute? What is the attribute that I care about? What is the attribute of concern here? The thing that I select on is what is the selection condition on? Great. Okay. So that means I often need to know for each double what the grade is. So that means, what if I created an index of um, on transcript grades? Okay. So that means that I can store all the grades for every tuple, a copy of it in a new place. This is actually a view, but I actually store the value. And I can quickly go through all the grades to figure out which tuples have valid grades, and then return the IDs of those tuples so you can read them. I can create, let's go back to other queries that we had. These were not necessarily the best queries we had today. Um, So let's say often what you want is, for example, you want to know all the information about the student for a given ID. If I actually store in a place all the valid IDs, then I can quickly find the tuples that uh, satisfy IP is equal to 3. How many such tuples do I expect? How many tuples for ID is equal to 3? Wow, all right, you're mostly awake. So that's actually uh, even an ideal thing. So I can create index SIDX, you have to give it a name, on students ID. So if I'm now executing this query, what will happen is that it will uh, first give an ID equal to three. It can quickly find what tuple is containing that value, if any. Then for that tuple, I need to read the remaining attributes and return this query. Okay. So basically, an index is simply a set of um, kind of a uh, redundant copy of the values in the database that you can first read, like you read the table, to quickly find the answer to this query. But this index only has IDs, so if you need other attributes, you need to go and read the remaining, the, the matching tuples, and then return those tuples. Okay? So, what is a good index? A good index is one where if I'm selecting on a condition like this, that is going to only return one or two matching tuples, 
right? This index is not so great because whenever I search, I generally search for it's not null. But if this is going to have all the classes ever offered by RPI, most of them will have a grade, right? Except for the current semester. So this is not very selective. It's not going to be very easy to do. Um, let me try to give you an example. So the last couple of weeks, I have been working with the admissions, right? So I'm, I'm the graduate program director, so I deal with admissions. So what you need to do is generally read people's um, uh, applications, right? So there's a little window that basically you can type in somebody's name, and then it will find it, and then you can click on it to see. So whenever I find a name, right, I can type any part of the name. But which part of the name do I start to type? Well, the last name is less like less uh, common, right? So if if I say let's say John or uh, um, Sarah, it's a common name now. It's very common, like Sibel is a very common name among people of my age, right? So if I type Sarah, there may be ten people named Sarah, right? So I try to find things that are actually more discriminative, right? So the last name. Or you generally pick up a part that you think is the least common. Like the first name is very uncommon, right? Like merit is very uncommon. All right, I will start typing merit. So this is the general idea that you generally want to create an index on something that is very selective. That when you select on equal of that, it's going to return a few tuples. Okay. Um, because of that, indexing is useful, but only for top for uh, conditions that are actually very selective. And um, there are exceptions to this. Sometimes if your database is stored, ordered by grade, then you can have a good index on grade because you can start to find the first tuple with grade equals, let's say, A, and then go to sorted order. But, you know, we will go to that when we talk about B trees. This is going to be, again, the first topic right after the right. But the thing to remember is this notion of selectivity. Whenever you search on what you index on, should only return you a few matching tuples. Percentage of tuples matching a query on the indexed attribute must be small. Um, Okay, um, so we will go. We will go back to indices. Just that there is a relationship with you, so that's what I want to mention. Um, one thing that I will tell you is uh, this notion of an index and a single tuple is so important that there are databases that are dedicated to that. They call them key-value stores. Have you heard of them? Okay. Furthermore, in fact, uh, the first few years of Amazon. All they did was to create an infrastructure that allows you to quickly find even the key information for that, right? Given the key, find information for that um, book or whatever you're going to purchase so that I can construct my uh, results page. So basically being able to extract information like this is very important. And there are many, many structures and index is one of the most rudimentary ones, but there is more. Okay, that's all I have on indices for now. Any questions? So views are not stored, they're just queries. Indices are redundant copies that you actually store, but views, the indices can be very fast for the things that you're searching for if they are very selective, but they are not necessarily a solution to everything. If you have a table that keeps changing all the time, then to change the table, now you have to change the table itself, as well as any index that is on that table, because they have to be up to date. So um, Postgres and many databases will create a primary index for the primary key. Anytime you create a table, it says it will create implicit table. So this is true for uh, Postgres. And that's partially that index is used to uh, decide how to store the table. But any additional index you can view as additional overhead. And um, 
if you have a system that is updated rarely but queried very often, then index the hell out of it. In fact, there are all these database benchmarks. Since they are much more queried than updated, you generally create so many indices that it's like 10 times the size of the data is indexed. Uh, but that's not true if you have many, many inter uh, transactions that continuously insert update data, then you don't want a lot of indices. You want a lean structure where you can append quickly. Okay, so that is that. And uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about things. Um, so one of the things that maybe uh, you may not know, but it's useful to know, is that uh, databases also store any information about itself in tables. So it's like a turducken. So it has like itself uh, inside another self. Um, so there are, these are called system tables. You can query them like any other. Um, so let me try to find you one or two. So for example, PG tables is the one that contains all the tables in the uh, database. Um, and um, it basically has the name of the table, the owner of the table, um, and the schema that it belongs to. So the way Postgres is organized is that um, there is a schema, it's a namespace. There is one called public, but that you can create as many as you can. Generally, when you start, it first searches for a schema that matches the username. And if it's not that, it searches for public. Whereas these are all under the PG catalog. So um, you can see all the tables, all the databases. This is just on my home computer. Um, you can have all the users. Okay, this is apparently a, not a very uh, exciting one. You can um, see all the views. This is just to show you that for each view, it actually stores the, um, the query itself. So for example, And I, the PG views can also be a view itself. I'm not sure. Okay, view owner. Okay. And this is the one view that I created. It actually stored the whole text for me. So whenever I use this view, it's going to read the text, put it in the query, and then optimize. Okay. Um, this is what PHP PG admin uses to show you all the different information because it can query these to uh, create a front end. So in this grand scheme of uh, databases, there are a few concepts, but the concepts are not identical in different databases. But the main concept is that you have a uh, database instance and within a database instance, you have databases, you have schema, okay? The schema are basically namespaces, but databases are actually uh, instances that you create tables in. So within a database, you can create tables for different schema but you really cannot share data between two different databases. So, you know, when you connect, you connect to a single database and then query from there. And then you have users. So all of you have usernames that allow you to um, do things in the database. And you can also create roles. Now, users and roles are the same thing in a sense that they are both the same type of entity, so I, I generally you uh, treat users as roles. So when we say roles, generally users are also treated as roles.
But roles are more general because roles can have multiple users in them. So roles can be groups of users. So this could be groups of users and roles. Okay. This is like, you know, how a trigger triggers a trigger. It's that kind of thing. So the roles have other roles in them. Um, so the way that you generally work with this is that you create a role. Okay, so you can say create role, let's say DB class. You can create user. Um, so let's say right, call it Sibelius. I continue to have high uh, security. So I can create a user Sibel S and uh, Sibel uh, T. Okay, so Sibel S is the student version of me, Sibel T is the teacher version of me. So let's see. I cannot create roles because I have to um, go in as a Postgres user. I generally do this to uh, make it hard to uh, do anything by myself. Um, so I can create new roles. I mean, even though I created a user, it treats them as roles. And I can create a role, let's say DB class. Now DB class is actually a um, is a role. It's going to basically encompass a number of things. So for example, what I can do is I can put other users into this role. So I can grant DB class to Sibel S. Okay. So now, DB class contains Sibel S, right? So whatever access rights that I give to DB class will also apply to Sibel S. Uh, but I did not give it to Sibel T, so this is a good way for me to see what are the things that you know Sibel S can do and Sibel T cannot do. It's like now I'm talking to myself. Okay, um, so just to show you. Oh, I didn't talk about updatable views. We'll talk about that later. So there are many different types of privileges that you can assign. And they basically go from uh, system level to object level. Okay? So at the system level, you can grant access to connect to the database. So you can access um, um, Login, which all of you have to have to be able to log into your own uh, database. <coughs> then uh, you can also give resource, which I forgot what that was, but it's an important thing. Um, and you can grant, for example, create database, meaning whether you can create new databases or not. For example, my user on my computer doesn't allow me to create databases for some reason. Then you can look at an object. So anytime you log in, the, the login user is the user that's accessing the database. So whatever the uh, login user has access rights to, that's what it can do. Anytime the login user or whatever kind of user is, creates a, uh, uh, an object, that object is owned by that user. So any objects that I create, they are owned by my user, which happens to be called Sibella on this computer. Right? So, Anything that I create is owned by me. But since I own some things, I can give access on that to other people. So I can grant access on the things that I own to other people. And these access rights can go very, very specific. Right? So I can grant select but not insert update and delete, which is why if you try, you can select from the tables in the database, but you cannot update them. Did any of you try? Um, you work very hard to make that happen. So it would have been good some of you tried and failed. Uh, 
because that was actually very difficult to do. Um, and you can also add other things like, for example, can I create a table that has a photo PTR table, right? That's actually a very intimate relationship, right? So you have to give an access right for that. Um, you can create, to give access to create triggers, create and connect, things of that sort. So you have to, it's supposed to give all of these uh, access rights anytime you create a table. Now, interestingly, you can also grant rights with a grant option. So not only you can give an access right, but you can also tell people that you can take this and pass this token on, right? So for example, I can say grant select on users or what was it, students, to DB class, right? So now this access right is passed on to every single student or every single user that is under this group that's called DB class, which includes Sibel S, but not me personally, but I am the owner, so that's okay. So for example, I can say set role to Sibel DB class, okay? So now I am actually operating as DB class. Um, right? I no longer, I don't actually have access right to students, so now I cannot do anything. So it says permission denied. Um, instead, whereas as myself, I actually have access right. But now I want to grant select on students to DB class. So that means if I were to set role as DB class, now I can do this, okay? So, um, so basically you can in fact decide to give specific rights so that you can inherit from those rights and you can test when you set yourself to that role whether you have that one or not. Um, and if you do actually do it with a grant option, then the person, so the DB class or any other user that has the grant option can also grant. So if you have, now the thing is that this is actually kind of complicated. So you need to uh, pick, you need to keep a whole uh, graph of what that looks like. So this is an example from a long time ago. You can see how long ago I took this class, but it actually has reference to Star Trek Deep Space Nine, a show that nobody cares about. Um, so, okay, so the idea is that this grant graph basically has an object like movie, and this double star means that Picard is the owner, right? So the owner you have double star. So this access right Picard gave to Cisco, nobody cares about Cisco, uh, but Picard gave Cisco a select only on name, okay? So if Picard actually gave a grant on select of name and select that that would be two different options here because you have to be uh, careful about, you know, there are two separate rights. And Picard gave to Janeway but with a grant option, so you have a star. So whenever you have a grant option, you have a star. And that, um, so that since this is a star, that means this access right by given first by Picard, then by Janeway, in two separate ways, right? So you have two different ways to get to this one. And similarly, Janeway also gave to Cisco a select of movies, so these are two separate access rights. So the idea is that anytime you do a grant, it basically um, is implicitly maintaining this graph of what is given to whom. And if you were to revoke privileges, then you actually have to figure out what happens by simply revoking on this. So if, let's say, I wanted to revoke, select on movies from Janeway to Cascade. So if I say Cascade, that means to delete this person and anybody that she has given this right to. Okay? If you did not put Cascade, then this revoke will not succeed if this person has given it to somebody else. So that's like a restrict option. If you say cascade, it will succeed always plus it will be everything else. 
So the way that I will do this is I will first delete this link to January because I am revoking this right, so this link no longer exists. Now, in my access grant rights, there should always be a link from the double star owner to everybody else. So, now this node doesn't have a link from double star, so this node is now open. As a result, I'm going to remove this node from my graph. So now these two nodes, of these two nodes, this one also doesn't have a path from the owner, so as a result, I'm going to delete that one as well. And this is what I have left. Okay, so whenever you do a revoke, you only want to remove the access rights that are driven from the one you are revoking. But if an alternate path exists, then you are going to keep them. Okay? You can also revoke just the grant option. Instead of revoking the whole access, right, you can also revoke just the grant option. So if I wanted to revoke the grant option, now I'm going to create a copy of this, but without the select. That means that Jane still can select, it just cannot pass it on to other people, right? So that means anything that is driven from this now or the node will need to be deleted, but this node is going to remain. So in the same way, I'm going to remove this node and this node, but this node is now going to exist because I'm not revoking select, I'm revoking the grant option, which is the start. Okay? So the idea is that, you know, ultimately the access right is a complex web of who gave what to whom, and you need to keep track of the same access right in even multiple ways, and then you can drive value from multiple ones depending on um, how many redundant paths there are, okay? So when we come back on Thursday, I'm going to do another recap on this, and I'm going to talk about some more advanced things. And watch out for the uh, homework later today.